This is going to be a great hour. Um, my name is Josh Sharfstein. I'm the Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement. And this is one of our pop-up practices, which we are doing with uh, Health Policy and Management. I want to thank Professor Rutko for helping to organize this series. Basically, when we have little opportunities to get great people here to talk about um, very interesting and relevant topics, that's why we call it a pop-up practice. We uh, got a note from Dr. Khaldun that she was going to be in the general vicinity and could swing by Baltimore on her way to BWI, and so we snapped it up. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, Jonay Khaldun is the director and health officer for the Detroit Health Department and a practicing emergency physician at Henry Ford Hospital. As the chief health strategist of Detroit, she does many, many different things. I would say chief health strategist, chief health implementer, chief health public relations, chief health, a lot of things. Um, she uh, works on collaborative partnerships, evidence-based programs, and uses a social justice lens focused on resilience and strength. Um, for example, under her leadership, Detroit has launched an 18-month community health assessment and is working to bring um, health systems and public health together to address infant mortality and teen pregnancy. She has been doing a lot on lead poisoning, which I'm sure she'll talk about. She is uh, leading several strategies on the opioid epidemic, and she is handling um, animal control. So in actual public health practice, animal control looms pretty large. In fact, we had a whole bunch of students here at the school, high school students, and someone said, what was the strangest thing that happened to you, Josh, when you were health commissioner in Baltimore? And we have Olivia Farrow here, who worked with me on animal control, and I said, there was an ostrich running around the Inner Harbor, which is a true story, and we got the call, there's an ostrich running around the Inner Harbor. And then the next question was, what is the hardest thing you had to do? And I couldn't resist saying, catching the ostrich at the Inner Harbor. <laughs> So um, animal services uh, brings a lot uh, to. Um, before she was in Detroit, Dr. Khaldun was the chief medical officer at the Baltimore City Health Department, um, where she did a, a lot of great work. She has held other local and national leadership positions, which was, I think, when I first met her, including director of the Center for Injury Prevention and Control at George Washington University, the founder and director of the Fellowship in Health Policy at the University of Maryland Department of Emergency Medicine, and she was a fellow in the Office of Health reform at HHS. She uh, trained at the University of Michigan, the University of Pennsylvania, and George Washington University. Um, and we are just so thrilled she's going to come talk to us. Let me tell you how we're going to organize this. She's going to talk for about 20 to 25 minutes. And then uh, Rachel Hartzell, who is the head of the Anabature Society of MPH, um, is going to uh, do a brief interview with her. And then we're going to take questions from the audience. So it's going to be um, great. I want to thank. Um, the Anabature Society, Nick Enquist, and Office of Public Health Practice, and um, Department of Health Policy and Management for today. And it is my delight to introduce Dr. Khaldun. All right. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you to Dr. Sharpstein and the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. Um, it's just really just amazing to be back in my old stomping grounds. I can't uh, tell you how excited I am to be here. I've got old friends from the Baltimore City Health Department. Shout out over there. Um, I'm just so incredibly um, grateful for your support always um, in my career. I've just really made such great friends um, in Baltimore. Uh, but let me tell you, um, there's also really just no greater honor in my life than the job, um, jobs, I guess I'll say, that I do right now. Um, I had the opportunity a couple of years ago to go back home uh, to Detroit to improve the health of a city, which, which really contributed to who I am personally and professionally. Uh, I often tell this joke about how my first interest or my, my, my first public health intervention was hiding my uh, sick grandmother's cigarettes when I was five years old. So those types of interventions for students in the room those interventions don't really work, um, but even at that young age in Detroit, I realized that I really wanted to do something to improve the health of my people in Detroit, and so that's what I'm doing every day, whether it's in the health department or in the ER in downtown Detroit. So I really just love what I do, um, and I'm also incredibly grateful to the folks in Baltimore for supporting me. 
So today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about um, what I do in Detroit. And you really can't talk about health in Detroit without talking about the history of the city. And as many of you know, um, so much of health is based on race, space, and opportunity, and Detroit is really a great example of that. So Detroit was once one of the most populous cities in the United States. You can see there in the 1950s, the city had a population of about 1.8, over 1.8 million people. And really, the history of Detroit is the history of my family. My family, African American, um, came up from the South, escaped sharecropping, and came to the Motor City for prosperity, for jobs and opportunities, and to raise family. And so I've got now about five generations of my family in, in the city of Detroit. Not just African Americans, but many folks from many different races and ethnicities came to the Motor City for opportunity. And what you actually had was you had cities or, or neighborhoods actually that were built around these car factories, right? You literally had these houses pop up around these car factories and that's just where people lived and worked and everything was great, right? And so you see here a, a, a picture of, of bustling Detroit in, in, in the 30s and 40s. Unfortunately, and I'll get into that in a little bit, what you also started seeing for many reasons was a significant decline um, in the city's population. And so you saw people, you saw resources and opportunity leaving the city, and you really started to see an accentuation of inequities, of blight, and, and really of concentrated poverty. So let's talk a little more about that. Um, does anyone in the room know what this is a picture of? Redlining, that's Detroit, yes it is, and it's redlining specifically. So redlining is something that did not just happen in Detroit, it happened all over the United States. And it was really one of the main accelerators of the decline in Detroit's population. And it's really federal housing policy. We often talk about, we kind of use this cliche term, um, social determinants of health, health in all policies. But this one particular federal policy had a significant impact on generations of poverty, not just in Detroit, but also across the entire country. And so this graph depicts redlining. And so in the 1930s, the Federal Housing Administration of the FHA uh, backed the Homeowners Loan Corporation. And the Homeowners Loan Corporation essentially went across cities in America and literally redlined less desirable neighborhoods particularly neighborhoods, as you can imagine, that included uh, people of color. And so what those red lines meant is that those uh, were financially undesirable places, right? It essentially became impossible for individuals in those neighborhoods to get good mortgages, right? It encouraged also uh, white people to move into other uh, more desirable areas. So the green, that meant green for go, that's good. And it actually impacted the ability of people in redlined areas to even get general credit, like just a personal loan, right? Commercial investors did not invest in these redlined areas. And so what you saw in these redlined areas where there were people of color, primarily, you actually saw these insurmountable barriers put up. And at the same time, the Federal Housing Administration actually incentivized white people to move to the suburbs. And how did they do that? So the Federal Housing Administration basically changed how mortgages were done across the country. And what they said was, you know what, we want to make sure we stabilize the United States housing market. What we're gonna do, we're gonna provide these low interest loans for white people in the suburbs. They're gonna be low down payment loans. And we're gonna change, back then, you know, you usually had a five to 10 year mortgage, and they actually changed these mortgages so you could stretch them out longer and have lower monthly payments. So what you basically had was a new opportunity for white people, not just in Detroit, but in other cities, to move into the suburbs. So when you saw that significant decline in Detroit's population, what you also saw were the car factories moving to the suburbs, you saw people, mostly people who are white moving to the suburbs. And you also saw, along the same time, this concentration of poverty and lack of resources and inequities that still exist in the city of Detroit today. And so this just goes a little bit more into the underwriting manual. So the Federal Housing Administration, they still have this today. It's called the underwriting manual. And you can see a sentence there. If a neighborhood is to retain stability, it is necessary that property shall continue to be occupied by the same social and racial classes. This is not evidence-based. 
this is just showing the racial segregation and the, the prejudices that existed then and quite frankly still exist today. That's just a picture again, people just really wanted their neighborhoods to be the same as they were. And what you actually saw, and this is a graphic of the population of Detroit during that time, where you saw whites moving out of the city, a significant decline after 1950. You saw a slight increase in the number of African Americans who were coming into the city. And then what you saw, which I know many of you have, have heard about, between 2000 and 2010, you saw both populations decline significantly. And actually, Detroit lost about 25% of its population between 2000 and 2010. And so you had this concentrated poverty. You had resources moving out into the suburbs. You had jobs leaving. You had the car industry really declining. And so when you think about that and that concentration of poverty, you have to think about, okay, how does this impact health? I think one unique thing about Detroit, uh, which I didn't even realize until I, I, I was leaving Detroit, is its geographic space when you compare it to other urban areas across the country. And so my entire family is from Detroit. I grew up down the road from Detroit in Ann Arbor. Um, and so I, you know, I didn't really travel much when I was a child and not until I was looking to go to various colleges, a lot of them on the uh, East Coast, did I start seeing differences in cities. So I'll never forget, and I always remember this story, I was, I was being recruited, I ran track, right? So I was being recruited at, at various cities. I remember the recruiters driving me around and saying, oh, look over there, that's a neighborhood where families are living um, and, and you know, we, we've got this and we've got that. And I was looking around and I couldn't see the neighborhoods because I saw all these high rises and subways um, and I didn't, in my young, naive, hadn't really traveled much mind, I didn't actually understand that a city is not necessarily Detroit. In Detroit, even folks who have fewer resources, still in the inner city you have people who live in single family homes with yards and fences, and that's just what inner city was to me. So I actually could not understand how a city would be like high rises. And still to this day, you know, I prefer my, my house and you know, in my yard, <laughs> because for me, that, that's, that's how I grew up. That's what I think of as a city. And so Detroit, this is looking north um, past Detroit, but it's just very spread out, not a lot of high rises. This is actually, uh, a very unique picture, but it also talks about the density of Detroit. So basically, this is a single home, right? And there's not a lot of uh, other folks around it. Not every neighborhood looks like this, but when you think about on the ground what Detroit looks like, I think this is incredibly important. So Detroit has about 680,000 people. It's about 139 square miles. If you took that same number of people in Detroit and had the same density as a place like New York City, you could actually fit it into 24 square miles. So you've got, and you can see that red outline there, that's actually the geographic space of Detroit. So what we have, which is incredibly important when it comes to talking about health, we have concentrated poverty. We have folks who are very spread out, a, very, uh, a lack of density in the area. And unfortunately, something that's very unique about Detroit as well as a major city, you, Detroit was made for people who had cars, right? There was no robust infrastructure for transportation that, that was built in Detroit. And so we have buses, and thanks to our mayor, the buses are running on time again, and you can actually get a bus if you want one. But really, when you talk about um, access to things, you talk about health, it's incredibly difficult for people to get to the services that they need in Detroit and has implications for how you think about public health and everything really in Detroit. And so let's talk a little bit about health. So this is actually Wayne County. So Detroit, and you can imagine based on the graphic where Detroit actually is within Wayne County, but Detroit's in Wayne County, and you can see there is a significant disparity. I mean, it goes all the way from, in downtown Detroit, the, the life expectancy of 69, all the way to the more western edge of, of Detroit. You can see 81, and those are very, I know this area well, those are very well-off neighborhoods, um, many of which I cannot afford to, to live in, quite frankly. Um, but you see this significant disparity. And what you'll also notice, and I've mapped out, actually, where physicians in the Detroit area um, both where they live and where they work. Um, and what you can see is right over that eastern line there, 
it jumps. One zip code over is an increase in 11 years in your average life expectancy. I happen to know a lot of physicians live in those particular zip codes, 48236, 48230. So you have significant disparities. I would say they have significant implications for health. And this just also really shows in Detroit, if you have the exact same income, and we're talking about the bottom 5% when you're looking at medium income. So all these folks on the left side of the slide make the same amount of money. Why is it that making the same amount of money, the same federal poverty level, you actually have a significantly lower life expectancy than you would if you had that same income living in Dallas, San Francisco, or New York City? And the difference really goes back to geography, it goes back to space, it goes back to density, and really the lack of focused resources, unfortunately, um, that is, has uh, plagued Detroit for some time. It's really important to me that when we talk about Detroit, we have to talk about the truth, we have to talk about injustices, but it's incredibly important that we talk about the resiliency of, of the people there. And so Detroit uh, really is just a city of people who, who, who love the city, they love each other, people are owning businesses, they've owned businesses there and been supporting each other for decades. My 91-year-old grandmother still has the same pristinely manicured lawn, and she tells me I better have some flowers at my house too, because that's what you need to do when you have a house. And so, who have been there for generations, who love the city, have kept the city going. So when you talk about uh, Detroit, even though you have to talk about the truth, Please don't just talk about all the, the gloom and doom, right? Because there's a lot of great things that have been happening in the city and that have continued um, over the past several years. And so it, it's no secret that in Detroit in 2013, um, we went through the largest municipal bankruptcy in US history. And, and, and I'll say, I guess I'm biased, but I, I would really say that a lot of the rebuilding and growth that has occurred even over the past five years, Detroit looks very different now um, than it did five years ago, and it's because of, I would say, the leadership of our mayor, Mike Duggan, who just got elected, re-elected um, for another term, but just there's, there's reinvestment, there's people coming in, there's people buying houses, you're seeing property values across the city actually increasing for the first time in decades, and so for me, it's really just an honor to be there at this point in time and be a part of this rebuilding. So let's talk about public health specifically in Detroit. So Detroit has a long and very strong public health uh, history going back over 100 years. So this is the Herman Kiefer building. Uh, my grandmother actually used to work as a clerk um, in, the, in the Kiefer, they call it, uh, <laughs> decades ago. And so there's kind of this, this joke or this, this, this tale in the city of Detroit where people actually used to tell their children, um, you know what, if anything ever happens to you, you ever get lost, just get in the cab and tell them, take you to the Kiefer and they'll take care of you there. I kid you not, um, that's what it is. And so this Herman Kiefer building um, is, is basically where we had in the early 1900s, a public health hospital, really robust public health services, and really was, was a part of, of life in Detroit. So unfortunately, with the bankruptcy um, between 2012 and 2013, all of these robust services, this, this deep history, um, basically went away. And Detroit basically closed its public health department privatized its services, and it went down to a very skeleton staff of about five people. I'm gonna pause for a moment because that is unheard of. It's absolutely unheard of, and the implications of that are significant, and I see uh, the impacts of that decision and that decline in the work that I do every day. So this is, this is a question. This is what I do every day. How do you actually rebuild a health department, and we're still rebuilding, in a city that has faced decades of disinvestment and the largest municipal bankruptcy in US history? And so really, it's, it's how do I think about health in Detroit? So I'll be honest with you, there were, by, by law, basically, a mandate for there to be those five skeleton people in the health department, and one of those was health officer. And I am actually the fourth health officer um, in the city in as many years. And it's incredibly important to me, again, I'm back home, these are my people, it's incredibly important to me that we bring stability and sustainability, not just to the health department, but to the entire public health system in the city of Detroit. 
so that long after I'm gone, and I intend, unless someone kicks me, you know, screaming and dragging, I intend to, to stay here as long as I can to really make a significant impact on the system. And so one thing, when I became health officer, I said to my team, you know, these, these programs are great, but, but there's two questions I often ask. One is, we don't have to launch every program, right? Public health is not about launching single programs at a local health department. It's really about the system. And not every part of the system is located here. There's hospitals, of course, and doctors, but there's schools, there's civic groups, there's neighborhood organizations. It is my responsibility as the health officer and that chief health strategist to understand robustly the public health system, to understand the issues, to understand things like primary, secondary, tertiary interventions, Let's drop in some public health language there, but understand Understanding robustly the system and helping to coordinate and strategize for everyone. What that means, and what I've told my team sometimes, we don't have to do everything. That's the first thing I ask. And the next thing I ask is, okay, we're launching what? How have we truly, genuinely engaged the community? It is critically important when you think about this system that you think about the people. We're not here with our degrees and our backgrounds and our titles to do things to the people of Detroit. And I truly believe that the greatest solutions to anything really, including public health, come from the community. And it is our job as people who are blessed to have these positions to really help uh, support the resilience of the community and not to come in and do things to the community without their genuine input. And I'm just not just talking about a focus group and now, now, that's nice, we're gonna do what we want anyway. I'm not talking about here's a plan we developed behind closed doors, here let's have one form where you implement my plan. I'm talking about from the very beginning including the community in the, in the inception of, of, of work and programs and systems building. And it takes a little longer, um, but I think it's the right way to do things, and I'm really just proud of my team and how we've aligned our work at the health department in this way. And so Public Health 2.0 in Detroit is all about neighborhoods, it's all about people, and it's about partnerships. And so when I, when I came into this position, there's, there's so many, I mean, you name, and I didn't wanna go into it here, but you, you name the uh, public health issue, there are significant disparities in Detroit. Um, and, and so what do you do, right? The Detroit Health Department five years ago was basically non-existent. How can you really make a significant impact on the trajectory of health in Detroit? And, and this quote from Nelson Mandela really, really speaks to me um, and how we've kind of aligned our work, our immediate work in the health department. There can be no keener revelation of a society's soul than the way in which it treats its children. And so what we've actually done um, in the health department is aligned our strategic goals over the next few years, really focusing on healthy babies, so planned pregnancies, healthy babies, and healthy children in safe environments. And again, I, I don't have the time today to go into details about all of it, but I would say if we can really change the trajectory of infant mortality, of unintended teen pregnancy, making sure children are able to learn and live in safe environments, I think we will make a significant impact for generations in the city of Detroit. And that is why we're focusing a lot of our efforts um, here. So briefly, um, or what I didn't talk about is, is the community health assessment. Part of that infrastructure building and that sustainability is really making sure that we have the policies, procedures, and systems in place at the health department. So we're actually launching, as Dr. Sharpstein mentioned, a community health assessment, which, which is a robust, again, 18-month planning stage. It takes a while. It's not one form, and then you go in and launch the plan. But you really work with the community to hear their voice, prioritize public health issues, identifying resources and assets, which is very important, and then we implement strategies that are locally relevant. The goal and the key to this is public health really belongs in the community. And this is just, um, I, I love my team. We even have youth visioning sessions here where we had our, our young people drawing pictures of what a healthy Detroit looked like to them. Um, and so we are full court press of all of this, and I'm really proud of the work we're doing. I spoke briefly about unintended teen pregnancy. A teen in Detroit is two and a half times as likely to get pregnant uh, than the typical teenager across the state of Michigan. We know that significantly contributes to the infant mortality rate. We know that a mother who, who has a baby before they're ready is 50% um, likely to graduate from high school by the time they're 22. 
But we also identified when we uh, were talking about uh, what we could do about unintended teen pregnancy in the city is understanding where all of the providers, where all of the contraception, so I'm talking about LARCs, and this is not a contraception lecture, but you're talking about unintended teen pregnancies, it's about access to contraception. We're talking about IUDs, we're talking about subdermal implants they, that uh, emit a hormone. And so what we know is there's not a lot of providers in the city who are providing those services. Um, and we know that 18% of Detroit teens don't use any form of contraception. And so we thought of it as a collaborative approach when we address unintended teen pregnancy. One, let's identify. We actually have mapped out, and I know every single provider of LARCs uh, in the city of Detroit. We actually are, have developed a network. We bring them all to the same table. We're sharing best practices, challenges. For example, I know that some health systems can't take certain insurances. So we say, you know what? The health department is actually opening up a clinic. You can actually send your clients who don't have the right insurance for your system to us, and we'll make sure that we coordinate those services. And we're actually going to be providing a ride. We've actually partnered with Lyft, we're providing rides to our actual reproductive health clinics. We also are trying to really change the conversation around reproductive health in the city. And it's really important here when we talk about reproductive health, it's not about we don't want African American women reproducing. And that's incredibly important. What's important is that we, we make sure everyone understands they have a choice as far as when they want to become a parent. And so we've actually engaged, for the past year and a half actually, been engaging our youth groups, focus groups. They are actually looking at our campaign materials. They didn't like it, so we scrapped it. Um, but again, it slows down the process. But what I'm, what I'm excited about is that I think when we actually launch this campaign in the next few months, we're going to have a significant impact on, on the conversation. Again, it's about a conversation with the community. So we're excited about that. Detroit's infant mortality rate. There's been a lot of national conversation recently about uh, the black infant mortality rate and the maternal mortality rate as well. And Detroit has one of the worst infant mortality rates um, in, in, in this country, and, and quite frankly, worse than many other quote unquote uh, less developed uh, countries around the world. Uh, a, a baby in Detroit is twice as likely to die before their first birthday than the rest of the state of Michigan. And that's basically 134 babies across the, the city who are pronounced dead before they turn one. And so what we decided to do, and again, I love this because we really are using the greatest asset of Detroit, which I believe is, is, is are the people. We're actually partnering with the hospital system. We had a hospital system who was you know, na internationally known, actually, for doing this engagement and, and, and getting women into prenatal care and, and doing these cervical length screenings. They were doing that on their own. And we said, you know what? Why don't we engage the community? Why don't we actually develop a program, and it's called Sister Friends. We actually are going to be pairing, and are pairing, regular women who just care with pregnant moms, and they're just walking them through their pregnancy. I have three children. I am a physician, but let me tell you, there are things they don't teach you in medical school. Um, and it is great to be able to have someone that you can call on uh, throughout your pregnancy. And you know, I have a personal story. It's, I know it saved my life after I had a significant scare, after I had the birth of my first child. And so this social support network, which is the core of public health, is what we're bridging with hospital uh, outreach programs. And we actually, again, provide lift rides. We are providing lift rides. If you're a pregnant woman in the city of Detroit and you are part of our Sister Friends program, you get a ride to your prenatal appointment, you get a ride to our education classes, you get a ride to our support sessions, all the way through the, the child's first uh, year of life. And so we've had great outcomes so far. Um, we've got about 150 pairs. Our goal is 500, and we'll be spreading this out. It's really a movement. We'll be spreading this out across the city. And finally, I want to touch on lead. Um, if you live in Michigan, um, and certainly everyone knows what's been going on with Flint, you really have to talk about lead. So what's important when you talk about lead, particularly in the city of Detroit, it's really about infrastructure and it's about housing. You have 93% of the homes in Detroit, and again, think about those kind of single individual homes. 93% of those were built before 1978 when lead paint was outlawed. And let me tell you, a lot of those homes have not been redeveloped. So when you talk about lead in Detroit, you're talking about 
old paint in older homes. Detroit actually has the highest percentage of elevated blood lead levels of any other city jurisdiction in the state of Michigan. Yes, more than Flint. And it's really because of this old housing. And so traditionally um, in public health, and it's always tougher in public health. We talk about primary prevention, which is basically preventing the poisoning or the, the public health issue from occurring in the first place. Traditionally in public health, there's been a lot of focus on physicians making sure they're testing children. There's been a lot of focus. And, and when I came into the health department, our program was essentially waiting for a child to get tested, and then we wrap them into our case management program, which is great. But less than 30% of, of kids who should be tested are tested. So what I said was, okay, we know we've got these, these old homes with lead paint in them. I literally wake up in the middle of the night sometimes and think about this, all the lead paint across Detroit, right? We're waiting for kids to get into our system, hoping that they actually get their, their lead test. So what I said, I went to the mayor and said, look, we've got to change our strategy. We've got to get to primary prevention. And so I brought together workforce, housing, our water department, our land bank, our buildings and safety department who oversees rent, rental properties across the city and said, what can we do differently? So again, thanks to the mayor and city council's uh, commitment, we actually just received $1.25 million in new city funding. And this is not a grant, this is from the city of Detroit to actually uh, implement this pilot program. And we'll be literally, again, talking about people in neighborhoods, knocking on doors in the top five zip codes where we've had elevated blood lead levels in children, getting into the homes, doing assessments, testing the child in the home if they haven't been tested yet. Even if they're, they're not positive for a lead test, we're actually going to be working to get those homes into the, we call abatement, so removing the lead hazards from that home. So we're doing a lot of community education. We're actually working with our schools and our child care facilities. And again, the key here is primary prevention before a child is poisoned. I'm really proud of this. Um, you talk about health and all policies. I worked with our buildings and safety and engineering department director. And, and last year, we actually, um, it was earlier this year, no, last year, we actually were able to get a uh, improvement to our rental ordinance passed where every landlord actually has to have their home lead safe in order for them to be in compliance. And so I get all excited about it. Um, there, there was some pushback from, from the landlords, but now we're going, again, knocking on doors, making sure that those homes are getting abated. And we've got on the other end with policy, uh, a very strong rental ordinance. So we're gonna be making sure that our families and, and our kids could be living in, in, in lead safe homes. Again, this is another thing I'm super proud about, um, focusing on neighborhoods. Again, we're just knocking on doors. We know that there are many people in Detroit who are living in occupied but foreclosed homes. We have no idea what's going on in those homes, but we had a guess that there were some significant challenges that we thought we could address. And so we literally launched uh, in December of last year, so a few months ago, a community health worker program. We literally are in the street knocking on doors. Hi, I'm so-and-so from the Detroit Health Department. How can I help you? We do a very brief questionnaire. We're finding pregnant women and connecting them to sister friends. We're finding people who are having other social human service concerns and connecting them to services with those warm handoffs, sometimes in the health department. So that's what Public Health 2.0 in Detroit is. We're getting into neighborhoods, we're talking about people, we're understanding the geography and space and concentrated poverty uh, in, in the city. And really, Detroit is incredibly resilient. Um, and it's just uh, an, an honor to be here speaking about the, the work that I love with you today. Um, and I'll, you know, I look forward to further conversation. Well, that was terrific. I'm going to ask you to step over me to the, um, okay. is that okay? Yeah. And Rachel, turn the, Come on up, we'll have a few minutes of questions and we'll open it up. Um, and uh, for the purpose of the recording, it's better if you can put your question down on the card. If you need a card, let us know and then I will read it off so that we have it all uh, recorded. Um, Rachel. Great. Well, first of all, I wanna thank you again for being here. As a student, it's oh. invaluable to hear real world on the ground experience. Um, I have tons of questions, but I'll limit myself to, I think, two or three so that the audience can also um, mm -hmm. participate. Uh, I want to first begin with 
knowing what it really is like to be um, the health commissioner of Detroit. Like, what's your average day look like? Um, just to start off the conversation. Uh, what is my average day? Um, it, it varies. Um, sometimes I'm, I'm, I'm looking at budgets and making sure we're spending our, our money appropriately. Other times I'm giving talks like this. Other times I'm uh, presenting to the mayor, and those are always uh, interesting presentation times. I, I would say that the reason why the city is, is, is coming back is because the mayor is just incredibly smart, incredibly detailed oriented um, but that means you got to be on, on, on point when you go and speak to him um, so so sometimes I'm doing that um, other times I'm out in the community I'm at one of our community health assessment events sometimes you know if we've got a lot going on I'm writing actual proposals and things myself because that's just <laughs> what happens and then on a lot of Friday nights you'll find me in the ER cracking chest sometimes that sounds <laughs> like an exciting job <laughs> Um, the other thing that I want to ask you, and I, I couldn't help but draw parallels with um, the history that you provided with Detroit, with Baltimore, mm -hmm. in terms of redlining and Absolutely. also in terms of declining population. And so my next question is really um, about looking back but and looking forward. What insights do you have having gone from Baltimore to Detroit and now working there? What insights do you have maybe for those of us who are going to stay and work in Baltimore about what we can do to address uh, health inequities here? Absolutely. Um, so I, I think that, one, I, I think I was a little bit spoiled in Baltimore. Um, <laughs> um, not that there are not significant inequities and inequalities and disparities, but Baltimore's health department is the longest continually running health department. Looking to my health department colleagues to check me, but <laughs> it, it still is, right? Yes, yeah, so the longest continually running health department in the country. So I, I think that um, when I came to Detroit and I just realized that I, I was probably taking some things for granted in Baltimore, um, that, was, that, was, that was an eye opener for me. I would say that what I've learned in, in Detroit, which certainly applies to just public health in general and, and working in Baltimore, is really going to where people are. Um, that's incredibly important. I think we have to move away from you know, setting up these brick and mortar sites and, and waiting for people to come to us and wondering why we're not able to address these, these public health challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, one example of that that, that, I, that I'd bring up is a hepatitis A outbreak that we're currently facing in Southeast Michigan. And so um, it's actually the deadliest hepatitis A outbreak in, in US history. Um, it's not just Detroit, but several counties and cities in, in Southeast Michigan. And the people who are most impacted by that outbreak are actually, like many other things in public health, our most vulnerable populations. So those who are men who have sex with men, those who already have hepatitis B or C, uh, those who are homeless, mm -hmm. um, those who have substance use disorders. And so, that's the highest risk population, but we've had challenges with, with reaching them. And, and really, they, they need a vaccine. The mm -hmm. hepatitis A vaccine is incredibly effective, but you just have to get to people. So what we've been doing in that outbreak is partnering with our soup kitchens. We literally were on the Salvation Army van. We're literally um, you know, getting my hospital, my emergency department colleagues. They're now screening and vaccinating high-risk individuals as they're coming through the emergency department, which is not the mm -hmm. norm for, for emergency departments. So thinking about where people are, not having to do everything necessarily from a health department perspective, but thinking about those community partnerships, those hospital partnerships, and really maximizing those efforts is incredibly important. Just building off of that, I think, and I, I don't want this to be a reductionist, but I love the people-centric focus that you've been talking about today. And I was wondering if you could identify who do you think those key levers are, those key people, um, if you had to say like the most important, where you can get the, the most bang for your buck. Those key people are the people that you're trying to uh, have an impact on, yeah. right? Those services you're trying to provide. I would argue you bring the folks, and it's, and it's difficult to do, mm -hmm. but it's not necessarily the people who lead every community organization, yeah. right? Not those people. Finding regular folk, <laughs> the folk who understand the difficulties of living in their neighborhoods. Mm. You may have done your, you looked at your data, done your analyses, but you'd be amazed what you find out when you just talk to regular folks. And that's really how we're doing our work at the health department and across the city as well. That's great. I think I'm gonna open it up now to um, questions because I know that friends that I've heard of have lots of things that they would like to ask you as well. Great, and why don't you tip there, Rachel, in case you wanna follow up any of great. the answers, okay? So we have some great questions here. The first one um, that I want to read, I now can find it. 
I will paraphrase. I put it in my pocket. It's an excellent question. When you talked about the um, flight of a lot of white families from Detroit and a lot of the wealth that went with them, leaving Detroit much poorer than its surrounding counties, that has persisted today. Mm -hmm. Have you thought about regional solutions to any of these challenges? And what does that discussion look like in Detroit? Absolutely, and, and, and it's, it's very complex. Um, when you talk about solutions, so regional transit is a big thing right now in, in, in Michigan. And you know, I, I briefly showed a picture of, of, of a news story where Amazon uh, did, decided not to choose Detroit for its new site. And the story behind that, and I don't know exactly what Amazon was thinking, but there's this perception that perhaps it was because we don't have a regional transit, a uh, transportation system um, that that was a part of that decision that thought has occurred to people in Baltimore also there we you go know, <laughs> yes um, again I don't know but um so I so yes we absolutely are um, working on those kind of regional partnerships even like I said the hepatitis a outbreak I speak on a regular basis with my other um, colleagues and, and, and county health health officers in other areas Not to push it a little further yeah. but like what about regional solutions to school funding regional solutions to housing and segregation and some of these other underlying issues where right. there's so much wealth around cities. It's right. obviously an issue here also. We have. Um, I think we're still trying to develop those those partnerships a mm -hmm. little bit, but I think we've certainly started them. Um, the Detroit public school system um, has its challenges, but we've got a great new leader who's starting to think about those partnerships and building the system. Um, what I'd also say, you brought up education, roughly half of Detroit's children are actually in charter schools. So when I go and think about how I can engage the school system, in Baltimore, again, we had primarily, it was, it was the, the public school system, um, and we had even the school health clinics that were run through the health department. That doesn't actually exist in Detroit. So I think we're still building towards that, but it's certainly not as strong as I would like it to be. Great. Uh, another question about um, movement of people. As the city is recovering from the bankruptcy and more people are moving back into mm -hmm. the city, is that creating its own types of challenges for health, such as, you know, does gentrification uh, kind of rise on your radar screen as the displacement of people as uh, right. their property values may be rising as that hit um, Detroit in a major way. Right. I think it's certainly, gentrific gentrification certainly comes up often when we talk about the rebuilding of Detroit. But what I would say, and, and the mayor often say, says, we're rebuilding in Detroit a future for everyone. I think it certainly, I think we need to be realistic. I think it takes time. I think we're starting to see, certainly all of my work that I talked about is in the neighborhoods, and that's incredibly important in how we're focusing. We actually have development areas across the neighborhoods in the city. But you're right, probably in the first year or so, it was about can we get investors to come into the city? You've seen a lot of development in the downtown area, but now we've got that investment, we've got people. Um, again, sometimes I have funders coming to me so quickly, I, it's, it's kind of hard for me to get a proposal together quick enough. But a lot of our work that you'll see moving forward is in the neighborhoods, uh, but this, this issue of gentrification uh, certainly is, is a, uh, it's a real one that concern that people have, but I would I would tell you that over the next several years you'll be seeing that conversation and that narrative changing. Yeah. Okay. A um, couple questions about Detroit specifically and the recovery. One is um, now that the bankruptcy is over, is the health department getting all the money it needs? Is the state chipping in? <laughs> um, and the other is how do you compare the role of the public system? You know, the mayor, the city elected officials versus the role of industry in the rebuilding of Detroit. Right. Um, so is the health department getting all the money it needs? That, that answer, I feel like, is always going to be no, right? Um, <laughs> but again, I've got a mayor who cares about infant mortality and teen pregnancy and has approved my budget to focus on those programs. Just approved because basically I asked and put together a plan, $1.25 million for lead work in, in the city. Um, I would say, even though I, I think it's not perfect, we could always use more. Um, I'm kind of in public health heaven a little bit to have that, <laughs> that level of support. Um, I mean, it's serious. I, I, I go around the country and ask if you've got that level of support for public health initiatives in your health department. And I don't think a lot of health officers could, could actually say that. Um, 
And so to your, to your next question about the role of industry versus the role of the city, I think again, it's all about partnerships. Um, we actually have a lot of work that we're, that we're doing now thinking about, okay, how can we work with our community development organizations? How can we make sure we're supporting those kind of smaller businesses, those people who have been in the city that, I've, that I talked about earlier? Uh, so, so we're, we're. I think it's a, a collaborative partnership. I don't think the city government alone can can do it all. Now you mentioned three priorities: um, infant mortality, teen pregnancy, and lead. How did you get to those? It can be hard to get to priorities. What do you say to the people who their issue is asthma or right. addiction or cardiovascular right. disease or any of the other things? Right. That are out there? So when when I talked about prior, priorities, it's where we I guess spend most of our time, where we're kind of hardcore going for a, a lot of funding, where we've gotten actually millions of dollars in funding. But what we're also doing is, is forging those partnerships. What I had to think about, okay, the health department is running. We're open again. One day we weren't, now we're open. What can you really do strategically that will interrupt intergenerational poverty in the city and have a significant impact? And again, those strategies were for the next three or four years, right? I'm not saying that's all we're ever going to focus on, but those are for the next three or four years. And I'll be honest with you, if we can tackle those challenges, I, I promise we will have a significant impact on public health for generations to come in the city. Um, I also say that it's not that we're ignoring other things. We actually just got funding to work on the opioid uh, epidemic um, from one of our foundations in, in the area that have been inc incredibly supportive. Again, you know, working with my colleagues in the Baltimore Health Department, learned a lot. We, we did a lot. Certainly had a robust um, uh, campaign and efforts there. So some of that work I've brought back to Detroit. We actually are doing uh, detailing, so knocking on doors of, of pharmacists um, who are not currently giving out naloxone under our state standing order. We're we're actually going to be launching a robust uh, anti-stigma campaign. We actually just put in a massive purchase for naloxone, um, so I'm excited about that. So we'll be doing our trainings. And then working on, this is the more complex part, which, which my colleagues know, is working on getting people connected to treatment. So I'm actually uh, working with several hospital systems. And again, I'm always biased towards public health and the emergency department. But thinking about, is there something we can do there? At that moment when someone has overdosed, they're brought back by the emergency physician from naloxone, can we actually get them connected to treatment or at that point? start treatment in the emergency Ex start, Exactly, yeah. starting treatment in the emergency department. Again, there's some, and, and I learned that here, there's some conversations. There's, a, there's kind of a change in culture that you have to work on. But, but they know I'm, I'm there, and I always bring up my my, my fun times in Baltimore and say, well, Baltimore did it. Yeah. Um, and so, um, <laughs> so, so I, I think you'll be seeing more of that in Detroit in the upcoming years. Well, that's good. I, I used to be on panels and people would say, what's your top priority? And nobody would answer the question. So yeah. it's very hard. You have to be, I hope people realize, you have to be able to talk about everything mm -hmm. like it's your priority. So it, mm -hmm. and, but at the same time, you have to have priorities to be able to mm -hmm. make progress. Um, one question came in related to addiction which is what is the kind of status of the discussion of policing, incarceration, diversion from jail to treatment, and you know, how do you work with the police department around the addiction? We actually have a great partnership with the police department. Um, they actually already have a program called Ceasefire where they're connecting, focusing on targeted areas uh, in the city, um, gang members who are, are committing the, the most violent acts, if you will. And so we've actually, and, and I kind of went out and said, hey, you know, violence is a public health issue. And they said, you're right. I'm so glad you're here. Let's, let's come talk. So we're actually working with them to connect folks to, to various services. Again, thinking about that primary prevention and not focusing on police. Um, but we have a police commissioner who's incredibly committed, who cares about behavioral health, um, who doesn't want to just lock folks up. Again, I think we're still in the beginning stages. Um, you know, I'm, I'm looking again back to where I think I was a little spoiled in, in, in Baltimore, all of the great work that, that you all did, and Dr. Sharfstein, you certainly uh, were a part of for, for, for many years. But I, I think we're moving towards a more comprehensive approach to violence um, and working on those partnerships when it comes to opioids. An example, I, I just had a meeting with my police colleagues and, and they said, you know, we're looking at data, we're looking at where we can bring our enforcement, but oftentimes people call 911, we don't know what to do for them, right, for, for, for opioids and addiction. So I'm saying, okay, and we're currently developing this, this project, can we somehow connect folks who are struggling with addiction at that point when the police is in front of them and they don't want to arrest them, they're, they're not going to arrest them, but they feel like they're just walking away, and they want to do something. So we're now working on that partnership there. 
Great, Rachel, do you have any questions at the moment? I just wanted to know about your, your best moment, like your, that you, since you've been there, making you brag about yourself. <laughs> oh, um, oh, my best. Your biggest win. My biggest win. Um, I should have thought about this before. What is my <laughs> biggest win? Um, there have been several times in meetings where I've kind of done a, done a moonwalk. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I just, I just am excited about the health department being back. I mean, getting this lead money. I, I can almost smell the change in the public health uh, uh, impact uh, in, in the city. I, I, can't, I can't really pinpoint one particular thing. Um, I just think, I think my team at the health department is awesome. We are hardcore. There's this saying in Detroit, Detroit hustles harder. If you ever met someone from Detroit, we are kind of like rough around the edges. We'll call you out. That's probably actually how I ended up coming back to Detroit because I was like wondering what in the world they were doing in public health. And, and then I ended up, before I knew it, back in the city. Um, but uh, you know, I, I just love being there. It, it's great to be working with a team at the health department. And again, the mayor and my colleagues in the other city agencies, people just really care. And, and having been from Detroit, you know, and, and, and generations of my family there and seeing the decline, um, it's, it's just exciting to be there during this point in time. Great. Great. Thank couple you. more couple more questions. One is on your priority list, how high up is or maybe that's the wrong way to put it, but uh, in the in the public's priority list, your perception, marijuana and marijuana policy. Is that on your radar screen in the usual day, or is it? it, a, and it how does it? How does it affect your? What? It's it's certainly on on our on our screen. So the health department. This is a little people don't know. So we actually uh, inspect all the marijuana facilities in in the city. So that kind of comes. How many the, are there? Um, how many licensed ones? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and there's like a handful of licensed yeah. ones. Um, we're working on that, um, but 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 it's certainly on our on our radar. Um, the one thing that's actually come up in my conversations with police is that they're seeing cases of people who are smoking marijuana that's laced with fentanyl, and they're finding that people are actually dying, and they thought that they were smoking uh, marijuana. There's a public health advisory on synthetic marijuana yep, out right yep. now in Baltimore. Yep. Yeah. So so it's it's certainly. Um, it's certainly something we're, we're thinking about. Um, there's now been, with, with synthetic uh, marijuana in um, another, was it Indiana? Another Midwestern uh, state um, where they're actually seeing it laced with rat poisoning. I don't know if you've heard about that, but yeah. Right, so, so, so that's, again, something I was just, I'm on the Public Health Advisory Council, actually, for the state, and so that's something that we're, we're talking about, and how do we support our, our our public health system. Um, and I often, I, I raised my hand in this meeting and said, you know, often we kind of send out our alerts, but, and I'm an ER doctor, often those alerts stay way up there. It doesn't get down to the folks who are practicing on the ground. So again, it's something I worked on in Baltimore. How do we get those public health priorities and issues and concerns down, if you will, to the folks who are on the ground seeing patients? Great. Um, here's a question uh, from someone who says, I've worked in many jurisdictions as a clinician where I only call the health department for animal bites. What do you What's your relationship? You're working in the ER. You're seeing all these clinicians. What do you What do you want out of the clinical system in Detroit? I want them to know that that we're here to partner. We're not just. And I've been encouraging folks to call. I think a lot of the animal bites. Um, I might get in trouble for this, but a lot of the animal bite reporting has probably come when, when I'm working my shifts. It's people just didn't know <laughs> that they were supposed to do it. Um, but I. But I think. Um, Henry Ford actually just launched a, um, a, a public health emergency medicine committee. I'm working with them on that. Um, I think just understanding that public health is not all about fluff and all about, okay, do you have a clinic there um, that, that, that I can send someone to for an STD? But again, even thinking about our hepatitis A outbreak and how we've been able to work with our colleagues, the first thing I did was say, when, when the outbreak was revving up, was say, okay, we need to engage our hospital partners. We have now regular calls with our federally qualified health centers, with our hospital systems, our ER directors, um, to make sure they understand are in the loop as far as best practices. What's also fun, I think, for me about that is when they hear that another hospital system is either doing well or they're having a struggle. It's kind of peer learning and it also a little peer pressure, right? Uh, and that's how we've actually been able to get a lot of emergency departments vaccinating for hepatitis A. That's good. I think my experience is that over time, you get more and more confident yeah. about asking things at the clinical system. Yep. And you are, you know, seeing patients in the ER, which I even was never doing. And it, 
um, I think you'll find that you know they're going to respond very well to you, that they understand at some level the need to really contribute to the health of Detroit, um, and that as you just continue to do as well as you're doing, you're going to have more and more and more ability to influence them in contributing in all kinds of ways. But I think it's a huge opportunity. That's great. All right, final three questions. Um, I'm going to give you the, uh, the toughest one first, okay? Uh -oh. this is, which is um, a great question. Given what you've shown about the impact of racist policies and institutional policies and how they affected health, how do you think about policy solutions to undo some of those things or target some of those issues like housing and income and their role in the rebirth and rejuvenation of Detroit? I think that's a great question and it's incredibly important. So, so my, I do have a master's in public health, but it's actually in health policy. So the way I think about public health is often from a policy lens. Um, even, and I briefly showed the, the rental ordinance, that's just a, a law on the books. Um, and they came to me, you know, when, when the law was being re, redone to talk about how we can make it have the most significant health impact. Um, there's other policies that the city is implementing, whether it's mandating that a certain percentage of jobs go to people who live in the city of Detroit talking about education and jobs and that trajectory, changing the trajectory of intergenerational poverty. Um, there's also policies in the city that require for these new developments a certain percentage um, of, of that housing to be low income housing. And do you talk about those policies as you're doing your work on health? Oh, absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. I mean, health in all policies. I mean, actually, you know, people, they don't realize that there's a health impact often until I, and it's just those collegial relationships that I've built with my federal, uh, fellow cabinet members. Um, I, I think it's that relationship and then working with them. Not saying, oh, you're doing this wrong, but how can we work together? We actually have a re revitalization fellow at the health department who's working on these very partnerships that I'm discussing. Great. Um, next question, you know how it's like A or B, you know, so I don't know what, it, what A or B happens uh -oh. to be in this case, but for a public health department, it's best practice versus innovation. In other words, some people say I want to do the best practices, but then you're really only doing what's been done in other places. Mm -hmm. They may not necessarily apply. Mm -hmm. So I know it's not a war, but as you think about what Detroit needs, is it really to bring, you know, what percent, how, how do you think of best practice, what you need there, for like, look, we've got to really do some different things here right. in Detroit. So I think evidence and data is incredibly important, obviously. But you also, and this is the same in, in some ways in medicine. I mean, when, when you're practicing medicine, sometimes a, a study is published, but it takes 20 years before it actually gets into the textbook and actually changes medical practice. And so my, my purview is, um, even with our Sister Friends project that we're working on, it's a volunteer movement. We're going to see if it works. We think it will. But that's not technically evidence-based, right? There's no you know, randomized studies to prove that bringing uh, mentorship to a pregnant woman is going to work. But when you talk about those social determinants of health, the lack of resources, uh, women feeling isolated, and the stress, when we talk about maternal health, just the things that stress does to, to a woman and the impact that has on their health and the baby, I, I think you know, sometimes I don't like to use the word innovation. Sometimes I just like to think, you know what, let's just, let's just be simple. I mean, knocking on doors in a neighborhood, I don't know how innovative that really is, right? But you know what, where are the people at? We know there's no transportation. We know they're in these sparsely populated neighborhoods. Let's just knock on the door and see how they're doing. I mean, I guess that's innovation, but it's really just kind of a common sense approach. And we're gonna evaluate it and see if it works and sh share, you know, when it's successful. Uh, but I think it's, it's an A and B. Great. Well, um, it's not possible to listen to you and be uninspired. The only way you can listen is to be inspired, not just for what, everything you're doing, but just the enthusiasm you bring to actual public health. And my last question is how you could imagine that our school and other schools could be helpful to you. You know, I mean, I, I'm thinking just listening to you, like, what is it that we could do to be helpful? How do you you know, from anything, including how you can connect up with, you know, students, how you can send students to us, how you can, you know, all kinds of different things, but faculty, what kinds of projects, you know, you don't want maybe a project that'll give you results in 20 years, but, you know, sure, how, sure. how do you think about the relationship between your department and academic public health? 
Right, I think, I mean, when I said partnerships there, I know I focus on the community, and I do think that's the most important partnership, but we absolutely have partnerships with our academic partners in the area, Michigan State University, Wayne State University, the University of Michigan. I think it's incredibly important. They work with us on evaluation, on program development. Um, of course, academic partners tend to be very uh, excellent grant writers, so they can help bring in funding, um, and certainly just training the next generation of public health practitioners. Um, uh, I think it's incredibly important. So we actually have, have formed a partnership with Wayne State University and the University of Michigan where they're sending both public health students, medical students um, to the health department to help kind of bridge that next generation. Again, something that I was really proud of, um, where's Dr. Lamb? When I was here in, in, in Baltimore, bringing that partnership with, with Johns Hopkins University for their medical residents. So that's the same thing we're working on uh, in Detroit. Great. Well. Thank you, thank you, thank you for stopping by on your way thank you into for DC having and me. home. Please join me in a big round of applause for Dr. Thank and thanks to you all for your fantastic questions.